You're listening to a podcast from the Today programme on BBC Radio 4. I understand this is the first interview that you've that you've said yes to doing post handing over handing over the reins as such. It's true. Um, for for eight years, your alarm went off. You you woke up to the realization that you were president of the United States and faced immediately with a million challenges. Um, when you wake up now as Barack Obama, former president of the United States, what's different about your mornings? Uh, I wake up later. <laughs> and, you know, it's wonderful to be able to control your day in a way that you just can't as, as president. The job entailed uh, a wide range of responsibilities and a constantly f- full inbox. And uh, now, when I wake up, I can make my own decisions about you know, how do I want to spend my time what do I need to do to move forward the things that I care deeply about? And that's obviously hugely liberating. But the things that are important to me haven't changed. You know, I, I still care about making sure that the United States uh, and the world is a place where kids get a decent education, where people who are willing to work hard are able to find a job that pays a living wage, uh, that we're conserving the amazing resources of our planet so that future generations uh, can in- enjoy the, the beauty of this place like we did. And so, uh, although I don't have the same tools that I had as president, you know, I have to rely more on uh, persuasion than mm-hmm. legislation, for example. A lot of the things that uh, still motivate me and move me continue to this day. What do you miss the most? Well, I have to say, uh, because we were both in traffic today, uh, you know, the fact that I didn't used to experience traffic. I used to cause traffic, yes. much to the consternation of any place that I was visiting. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I miss my team. You know, there's a camaraderie and an intensity to the work. Mm-hmm. Everything you do every day, you know, can affect millions or billions of people in some case. And, and to have really smart, focused people who are there for the right reasons uh, and who over time have built up trust and have have learned to support each other and rely on each other. I I miss that. I miss the work itself uh, because it was fascinating. Rewarding as well. And and rewarding. And, And you knew that even if the politics of a certain issue didn't always work out well, that uh, by doing a good job, there was somebody out there maybe a mother who you know, was worried about a sick child and now had a doctor, mm-hmm. or you know, your ability to protect some people from those who would do them harm. Uh, you know, that kind of day-to-day satisfaction, I think, is hard to match. Can I take you back to the 20th of January, 2017? You're sat in Marine One, the presidential helicopter, flying over Washington. You've sat through the inauguration with your game face on, not giving much emotion away, as we all saw. Uh-huh. What's, going, what's going through your mind? You know, the first thing that went through my mind was, sitting across from Michelle, how thankful I was that she had been my partner through that whole process. You know, you've gotten to know Michelle quite well, and uh, she is a spectacular, funny uh, warm person. She's not someone who was naturally inclined to politics. Uh, so in some ways, despite the fact that she was, I think, as good of a first lady as there's ever been, mm-hmm. you know, she did this uh, largely in su- support of uh, my decision to run. And for us to be able to come out of that intact, that you know, our marriage was strong, we're still each other's best friends, our daughters turning into amazing young women. The sense that there was a completion uh, and that we had done the work uh, in a way that preserved our integrity uh, Mm. and and left us whole Mm. um, and that we hadn't fundamentally changed, uh, I think was, uh, was a satisfying feeling. Now, that was mixed with all the work that was still undone and concerns about how the country uh, moves forward. Uh, but you know, overall, there, w- there was a serenity there uh, more than I would have expected. 
was there was there, was there a sense of relief was there a sense of job done as best as you could was a unfinished business uh, it, uh, relief probably uh, isn't the right phrase because relief indicates some sense that uh, I can't wait until this thing is finished no, sure um, but the, pres the pressure but, right? but I think that there was a sense that that we had run a good race uh, and one of the metaphors I always used for the presidency is that you are a relay runner. Uh, there, there's a, a sense sometimes in any position of, of leadership that you by yourself do certain things and then uh, it's over. And I always viewed it as taking the baton from a whole range of people who had come before me, some of whom had been heroic, some of whom had screwed up. Mm -hmm. But wherever you were in the race, if you ran hard, if you did your best, and that you then were able to pass that baton off uh, successfully and the country was better off, the world was a little bit better off, then when you got there, then, then you could take some pride in that. And I think we were able to do that. For 16 years, you've been on the most punishing political treadmill imaginable. Um, but in 2000, no one knew who you were. Right. Four years later, you gave a speech which changed your life and you were elected to the Senate. Uh, four years after that, you were elected president of the United States. Mm -hmm. And four years after that, you were elected again. How did it feel to, to step off that treadmill after so much blood, sweat, tears? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I always said to Michelle, and, and I think she would agree with this, that it was some strange good fortune on our part that we didn't become famous or in the public eye in any significant way until we were in our 40s. And so despite this whirlwind that you just described, by the time I was elected to the U.S. Senate and I was a national figure, I was a grown man. I was settled. I was a parent. I had change diapers or nappies, as you call them, mm -hmm. apparently. Uh, <laughs> I you know, had, had struggled with figuring out how we were going to pay the bills. We had made sacrifices. You know, Michelle and I had had the arguments that married couples have. And so in some ways, I think, although the process was in some ways surreal because it happened so quickly, we were fairly steady in knowing who we were and what we believed in and what was important. And so there was a continuity there. And when I got off the treadmill, so to speak, uh, it didn't feel as if my identity was wrapped up in having had this position. And my relationship with my family and my friends, the values that I cared about, you know, felt pretty consistent. So the, the break did not feel as abrupt. Um, I do think that, you know, American politics is unique in the sense that there is just a perpetual campaigning taking place. Um, so the idea that I don't have to, you know, go raise money f for television ads, mm -hmm. that, that felt really good. <laughs> uh, the idea that uh, there were certain elements of the job that were largely ceremonial and that I, I always tried to do as best I could, but that you know, weren't things I necessarily would do on my own. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the fact that I had, was now freed up from some of that, yeah. uh, some of the pomp and circumstance of the presidency, that actually felt good. As the president, you had an, an unbelievable power at your fingertips. Yeah. You were in the most powerful chair in the world. Mm -hmm. Are there any big challenges which you care deeply about that will be easier to influence without that power? Yeah, it's an interesting question, and, and it's one I'm still trying to figure out. I, I do think that I am able to focus on what I think are long-term problems mm -hmm. in a way that, as president, you couldn't always do because your job, in part, is to respond to what's right there in front of you. It was a four, a four to eight year plan rather than a exactly. twenty to thirty year plan. And so, you, you take some of the tragedies that have happened recently, with hurricanes devastating first Houston and parts of Florida, and then now Puerto Rico. You know, my job, 
as president in those circumstances was first and foremost to make sure that people got help and that the government was effective and responsive. And I, I'm very proud of the work that we did there. And today, those aren't my direct responsibilities, but I can focus over the next 20 years in making sure that we don't have more hurricanes mm -hmm. <laughs> and natural disasters that are accelerated as a consequence of climate change. Mm -hmm. And the, the ability to focus uh, long term, I think, is a great luxury. It, it also gives you a, the ability to, to reflect and study in a way that sometimes as president you couldn't do the way you wanted because you just had to move very, very quickly. One of the interesting things about leaving the presidency is realizing that uh, my life had been so accelerated, everything felt like and still feels to some degree like it's moving in slow motion. Not necessarily in a bad way, but mm. I was talking to my lawyer and you know, he was saying, we have to meet with somebody right away because they really want to get something done. Mm. And I said, uh, okay, uh, how about tomorrow? He said, well, no, no, it's going to take at least two weeks to get it done. <laughs> and I said, and I had to explain, you know, uh, where I'm from, right away means if we don't do something in half an hour, somebody dies. Yeah. Uh, so there, there's just a, a, a lower intensity level. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that means you don't have the same adrenaline rush, but it also means that you can be, I think, more reflective and, and deliberate about uh, the kinds of things you want to get done. So, so you, would you say it's easier? Yes. <laughs> yes, but how so? The, the fact that I can wake up and if I want to spend an extra 45 minutes talking to Michelle mm -hmm. uh, and take a long breakfast, mm -hmm. I can do it. Uh, that feels great. And uh, I also think that it allows me to, to focus on how do I transmit whatever knowledge or experience that I've gained uh, to others to help them become more effective and more powerful. And, and I'm really obsessed now with training the next generation of leaders mm -hmm. uh, to be able to make their mark in the world. Uh, you know, one way I've described it is that I think when you're in politics directly, then you're a player on the field. And there's some element of that that you'll never be able to duplicate the, the excitement and the thrill and sometimes the agony and, uh, that goes uh, in, in being on the field. And now I'm making that transition, I think, to some degree as a coach. Mm -hmm. And you know, that has its own demands and its mm -hmm. own responsibilities and its own impact. And being a great coach is oftentimes just as satisfying as being a great player, but it's a different role, and, and that's sort of how I'm transitioning, I think. The last time that um, you and I uh, met was at, uh, was in London, yeah. and um, we spoke about how we could potentially work together on providing a platform for, for young people to yeah. meet, uh, which I know is something close to your heart. I'm, I'm certainly passionate about it as well. We're not the first people to say this. Right. I mean, I, I think uh, Whitney Houston even went on about it when I was born back in the 1980s. Um, but how, how do we actually make it a reality? It's all well and good standing up saying we need to let youth lead and we need to listen to them because they've got you know, fantastic ideas and they are inevitably the ones that are going to inherit the, the mess that we leave behind. But what, what does that platform look like for you? How do we, how do we give them a voice? Well, uh, this is something that I spent a lot of time thinking about. If you think about my campaign in 2007, 2008, you have this African-American, a mixed race, born in Hawaii, named Barack Hussein Obama, and somehow he becomes president. How did that happen? Well, it happened primarily because you had a bunch of 20-year-olds and 23-year-olds and 25-year-olds who started going out into communities that oftentimes they had never been in before and believed in the possibilities of a different kind of politics. And it was that grassroots army that really fueled my campaign, in part brought together by the new technologies at the time of social media. Well, you the first social media I, president. Yeah. Um, while I was president, I made a practice of meeting with young people everywhere I traveled. I'd have town hall meetings mm -hmm. 
along with the meetings that I had to have with prime ministers and presidents and, and my official duties. And what we discovered was is that young people were so interested in finding platforms for them to not just interact with me, but more importantly, interact with each other and come up with plans for how they might improve health care in their country or how they could conserve the, the natural resources of their country, that we set up this Young Leaders Program. We would bring over to the United States maybe 500, then 1,000, maybe a couple of thousand amazing young people from around the world every year. But for each one person that we brought here, there were 100 who would apply, who would become part of a digital network that was interested in social change. And we now have probably close to a million young people around the world who signed up and are, right as we speak, active in setting up health clinics in rural Africa or participating in human rights programs uh, in countries that sorely need them. So I've seen the power of these young people. And I think that the, the key, and this sounds simplistic, but it's true, is to have confidence and give young people the ability to make decisions and drive their own organizations. Give, give them the ability to uh, go out there and uh, and change the world. Do you not feel as though the old generation, the older generation, are slightly skeptical about of course. younger leadership? I mean, with the, with the experience, yes, it's of, of, of course they're skeptical. And young people will make mistakes. They're not perfect. I'm, you know, I, yeah. when I think about myself at the age of 23, 24, when I was a young community organizer, I was out there making mistakes all the time. Mm. But there is a energy and a spirit that can't be duplicated by somebody my age at, at the age of 56. There is a, a freshness to what young people perceive as possible. One of the things that I've discovered, I think, around the world, not just in the United States, is this generation coming up is the most sophisticated, the most tolerant in many ways, mm -hmm. uh, most embracing of diversity, the most tech savvy, mm -hmm. uh, the most entrepreneurial, but they don't have much faith in existing institutions. It's too easy for people to criticize uh, millennials yeah. for being you know, superficial, selfish, and self-obsessed. Self yeah, I just haven't, I, I haven't found that. I haven't seen it. Uh, I, I think it is a, an indication of the disconnect between... Generational divide. Not just a generational divide. I think it's also a, the bias of those who are comfortable with power as it's currently exercised. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember when we ran, uh, when I ran uh, in 2007, 2008, even after we were winning and we had won repeatest contests, you know, you'd have sort of older political operatives who said, this is never going to work. You're just relying on volunteers. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, you're never going to be able to get people involved by just asking them to uh, organize their own neighborhoods. You've got to pay operatives and power brokers. And we kept on saying, well, okay, that's what you think, except we keep on beating you, <laughs> doing, doing the thing that you say can't be done. Mm -hmm. you know, I think people get invested in the old ways of doing things, in part because that's where their power has come from. Mm -hmm. And it's up to, I think, folks like you and me who have an outsized voice to be able to encourage young people to think in new ways about social organizations and social arrangements. You know, here, I'll, I'll take a very specific example that I was just in some conversations about. I am a strong believer that in our current economies, globally, and certainly in the advanced economies, that workers increasingly have less leverage uh, in the marketplace, less control, and part of that is because unionization has declined precipitously. I am somebody who believes that the ability of workers to collectively organize and bargain uh, is important to balance their interests against the interests of multinational corporations. But I also think that if you are trying to organize workers based on 
models that date back to the 1930s and 40s, mm -hmm. uh, the industrial age where everybody was working on an assembly line in a community that was very isolated and everybody went to the same church and everybody lived in the same neighborhood, then it's going to fail today in a globalized economy. So you've got to find new ways to speak to workers, mm -hmm. some of whom are going to be in the service industry, some of whom are going to be women, some of whom are going to be minorities. And if, if you keep on doing the same things, then you're probably not going to succeed. But young people, I think, recognize th uh, that through the internet and through social media and, and other tools, they may be able to mobilize themselves to actually get something done. And, and the question is, can we encourage that process rather than just uh, you know, wave it off as, uh, as a pipe dream? Yeah. I mean, you, you managed to get people to use technology to take real action when you were elected um, all that time ago. Yeah. Um, I will, part of me wants to ask how you manage that, but at the same time, I think what I will do is social media, the, so, the social media landscape has changed yeah, dramatically has. Um, since then. Uh, issues of trolling, extre extremism, fake news and cyberbullying are yeah. major social issues. Right. Is, there, is there more that you could have done as president to get ahead of some of these issues, do you think? Well, most of this is happening in the outside of government. And in the United States in particular, uh, we have a very strong First Amendment. Uh, I am a, as a former constitutional lawyer, pretty firm about uh, the merits of uh, free speech. And the, the question, I think, really has to do with how do we harness this technology in a way that allows a multiplicity of voices, allows a diversity of views, but doesn't lead to a balkanization of our society, but rather continues to promote ways of finding common ground. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure government can legislate that, mm -hmm. but what I do believe is that all of us in leadership have to find ways in which we can recreate a common space on the internet. Because it used to be in the United States, at least, for example, we had three television stations and everybody watched Walter Cronkite or David Brinkley or whoever the chief anchor was. Everybody had a common set of facts. Uh, and so there might be conservatives and liberals, but people generally could agree on, on a baseline of reality. Mm -hmm. One of the, the dangers of the internet is, is that people can have entirely different realities. They can be just cocooned in yep. information that re reinforces their current biases. One of the things that I think I discovered even back in 2007, 2008, is a good way of fighting against that is making sure that online communities don't just stay online, that they move offline. Mm -hmm. and, and what I mean by that is that I think the social media is a really powerful tool for people of common interests to convene and get to know each other and connect. But then it's important for them to get offline, mm -hmm. meet, meet in a pub. Get out into <laughs> meet, the community. You know, yeah. Meet, meet it at, a, at a place of worship, mm -hmm. meet in a neighborhood, and get to know each other. Because the truth is, is that on the internet, everything is simplified. And when you meet people face to face, it turns out they're complicated. You know, there may be somebody who you think is diametrically opposed to you when it comes to their political views, but you root for the same sports team, or you notice that they're really good parents, and that's something that you as a parent care about. And debating it's important. And and you find areas of common ground because you see that things aren't as simple as have, have been portrayed in whatever chat room you've been in. Mm. And it's also, by the way, harder to be as obnoxious and cruel <laughs> in person as people can be anonymously on the internet. And, and so w one of the things we want to do, I think, is as we're working with young people to build up platforms for social change, make sure that they don't think just sending out a hashtag in and of itself 
is bringing about change. It can be a powerful way to raise awareness, but then you have to get on the ground and you actually have to do something. This is exactly what this is exactly what I ended up saying in uh, in the We Day speech in front of eighteen thousand kids uh, in the Air Canada Centre yeah. yesterday. Was we get we get it we get that uh, a lot of you are hooked on social media, right. but the important thing is that by liking something and sharing something isn't take, isn't no. actually <laughs> making change. change. Right. If you if you really want to make change, you need to look up from your phone, you need to get out into your communities, and you need to stand up for what you believe yeah, in. Exactly. Um, we can't be the older generation going, no to social media, it's bad for you, it's uh, bad for me, your well, mental that's, health. That's hopeless. It's <laughs> hopeless. It's a tool. Yeah. And used, managed correctly, it, can be it powerful. has an amazing that's power. Exactly so, right. you know, on the social media front, educate or regulate. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I am I'm big on education, as I said earlier, just because I think the notion that we are going to be able to corral, uh, that we're going to be able to contain what's said and what's not on the internet seems like uh, unachievable. And, uh, and, and contrary to the values of an open society that uh, both uh, you know, the United States and, uh, and Great Britain and most of the advanced world adheres to. Uh, I, I don't want to live in a world in which the state is making decisions about who says what. As president, you were uh, you weren't afraid to wear your heart on your sleeve, as 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 we all as we all saw. People were not used to seeing that from from leaders, mm-hmm. um, especially um, someone in your position. Was was that a conscious decision? Were you aware that you were wearing your heart on your sleeve and that moments of Moments of, of, of real pressure? Well, look, um, it, it, it's interesting. Generally, my reputation, at least in the U.S. media, was somebody who was very dispassionate and professorial and analytical, and, and, and some of that's true. But I did not think I could do my job well, and I actually don't believe any leader can do their job well if they don't have the capacity to feel deeply about the people that they are serving. And so I felt it was important if I was meeting with the parents of a child who had been gunned down senselessly by uh, gun violence, that they know I could imagine as a parent what they were going through. I thought it was important for me if I was talking to a wounded warrior uh, for them to understand that as commander-in-chief, even though I am responsible for ordering them into a a war theater, uh, and that I tried as best I could to to recognize that sacrifice had to be made to keep the American people safe, that I didn't take it lightly, and that the wounds that they had received were ones that I honored not just with sort of outward displays of patriotism, Mm -hmm. but that I honored by recognizing there was a tragedy involved in a young person being wounded. Uh, Mm -hmm. And and so we better all take these decisions really seriously. I I think the great danger that uh, often befalls leaders uh, is that uh, the people they're supposed to be serving become abstractions. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they're not abstractions. If you don't understand that what you do every day has a profound impact on somebody else, then you shouldn't be there. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to I'm going to fire in a few questions. Go ahead. Uh, but um, you talked about your experiences growing up and the fact that it wasn't easy. Yeah. yeah. Can you pinpoint a particular choice that you made that could have set your life on a very different path? Oh, I'm, tons of them. You know, I've, I've written about the fact that, in part, because. Uh, I didn't know my father, in part because I was raised by extraordinarily loving grandparents and my mother, but my mother traveled a lot, and my grandparents were older, that uh, in my teenage years I was doing a lot of destructive behavior. Mm -hmm. And that probably continued until I was about 19 or 20. And at any point between the ages of 15 and 19 or 20, I could have gotten off the rails. One of the things that I always say to young people that I meet who are in much tougher circumstances than I was, um, you know, young people who've gotten in trouble in, with the law, young people who've dropped out of school, 
particularly uh, in the African American communities uh, in the inner cities of the United States, you have a lot of young men who are having trouble and, and on almost every measure on average mm -hmm. uh, are, are having more difficulty. I always say to them, I'm just like you. The only difference is, is that I had a more forgiving environment. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason why I think it's so important for me to focus not just on leadership at the very top, the people who are going to the Harvards or the, or the Oxfords or you know, the people who are clearly uh, on the ascent, uh, but to focus on the leadership that exists among young people who've made a mistake uh, and need a second chance. You can understand why some people look at politics and the strain and scrutiny that it will place on them and their families yeah. and say, well, that's not for me, thanks. Um, you know, you, you chose public life. Your family didn't. It's hard. Being in the public eye is unpleasant in a lot of ways. It is challenging in a lot of ways. Your loved ones are made vulnerable in ways that might not have been true 20 years ago or 30 years ago. So it is a sacrifice that... I think everybody has to be at peace with when they decide to go into politics. But ultimately, I think the rewards of bringing about positive change in this world make it worthwhile. Michelle and I were able to protect our girls from too much scrutiny. I appreciate the fact that there was some restraint by journalists uh, in focusing attention on them when they were growing up. I developed a very thick skin. <laughs> And you know, that, that comes in handy if you're going to go in, into politics because mm -hmm. at any given moment, somebody is an unhappy with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But what, what an enormous blessing it is uh, to be able to say that 20 million people have health insurance that didn't have it before. Mm -hmm. And even a fraction of those 20 million mm -hmm. are leading better, healthier lives, are, are happier, some child is fulfilling their potential then you've made then, a massive difference then you know that's that's a that's a pretty good scorecard it's a, it's a huge difference yeah at the end of 2016 a lot of people were pretty relieved that 2016 had finished it was a quite a it was quite a, a turbulent year emotional year for a lot yeah. of people um 2017 hasn't exactly been easy uh, <laughs> for, for the world uh -huh. uh, many people are worried about the direction that the world is the yeah. world is headed can you give the people a reason to feel optimistic about the year ahead well, Please. you know, I, I, I don't think in terms of uh, one year, but I, I can tell people what I genuinely believe, which is uh, that if we take responsibility for being involved in our own fate, if we participate, if we engage, if we speak out, if we work in our communities, if we volunteer, if we see the, the joy that comes from uh, service, to, service others. to others, then all the problems that we face are solvable, yeah. despite all the terrible news that you see, despite all the genuine cruelty and pain and uh, hardship that people are experiencing around the world at any given moment of any given day. If you had to choose a moment in human history in which you would want to be born and you didn't know ahead of time whether you were going to be Prince Harry or Barack Obama or a small child in rural Africa or India, you choose today because the fact is, is that the world is healthier, wealthier, better educated, more tolerant, more sophisticated, and less violent mm -hmm. than just about any time in human history. You, you think about the history of the United States. Mm -hmm. It was only a few generations ago where someone who looked like me was in bondage, mm -hmm. or if not in bondage, then servitude, and couldn't even imagine having this conversation in this hotel room. It was just a few generations ago, where, where routinely women couldn't aspire to anything beyond yeah. caring for their children. The most noble thing you can do, but yeah, I want my daughters to be able to do other things, and they can do other things now while still raising a family. It was just a few generations ago, at a time when your grandmother, Her Majesty, was already an adult, when half the world was aflame and 60 million people were killed in 
a great global war. And when you think about the strides we've made just in my lifetime, and mm-hmm. I have some gray hair, but on the scale of human history, I'm, I'm a blink of the eye. <laughs> you think about how much has changed and, and how much has gotten better. Mm-hmm. Well, then that, that has to make you optimistic as long as you don't start thinking that any of us can sit back passively and, and assume it continues. History doesn't just run forward. It runs backwards and sideways, and it requires us to continually push. Yeah. Um, one sentence. What is your New Year's resolution? Well, this past year, my New Year's resolution I'm was... I'm sorry. Just give me one sentence, please. <laughs> well, if you're going to ask it that way, then I don't have one because, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I believe in New Year's resolutions. Typically, people break them. I believe in making sure that each day you try to do a little bit better than you did before. Perfect. Okay. Um, just now, just quickly onto the serious questions. Very, very quickly. Are you ready? Yes. It's a quick fire, it's a quick fire question round. Uh, White House down or Olympus has fallen? Didn't see either of them. You have to make a choice. I didn't see either of them. How can I make a choice? White House down. Okay. okay. I'll take your word for it. Um, what do you miss the most, the cinema or the bowling alley? Uh, cinema. All, we call it a movie theater, but okay. that's fine. Boxes or briefs? Uh, sorry, we don't answer those questions. <laughs> LeBron James or Michael Jordan? Jordan. Uh, although I love LeBron, but I'm a Chicago guy. Aretha Franklin or Tina Turner? Aretha's the best. Rachel or Monica? Uh, I like Rachel. Okay. I'll, I'll, I won't be telling Monica that. Uh, Kim or Chloe? The, the, this one uh, I, I, have to, uh, I have to defer on. Okay. Harry or William? William right now. <laughs> Titanic or the bodyguard? Titanic. Suits or the good wife? Suits, obviously. Great, great, great answer. Uh, cigarettes or gum? Gum now, baby. Gum. Uh, White House or Buckingham Palace? White House, uh, just because Buckingham Palace looks like it would take a really long time to mow. Okay, fair enough. Uh, A lot of upkeep. Queen or the Queen? The Queen. Okay, good answer again. Uh, The Rock or Chris Rock? That's an interesting question. I like them both. Slip and slide or electric slide? Electric slide. That's my generation. Fantastic answer. And lastly, uh, your last five dollars. Buy a burger or buy a lottery ticket? It depends on how good the burger is. But I like a good burger. Okay, good. Mr. President, thank you very, very much for sparing your time. I'm sorry we ran over a bit, but... um, Your Highness, I I enjoyed this, especially the lightning round. (laughs) Good. Appreciate you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hello, I'm Nick Robinson, and I present a podcast called Political Thinking, which tries to do just that. Think about politics. Longer, more conversational interviews, which examines the thinking of the people who shape our world, whether they're political leaders like Ruth Davidson or Ed Miliband or Francis O'Grady of the TUC, or writers and comics like Armando Annucci or campaigners like Peter Tatchell. But in the latest podcast, the producers had what they thought was a tremendously good idea. Why don't we turn the table and get a politician to interview you? They chose... A man who's no longer really a politician, he's theoretically at least a journalist, the editor of the London Evening Standard, George Osborne. I think it was a really, really bad idea. It reveals absolutely nothing at all. And I implore you, please don't listen. And above all, please don't search on your normal podcast provider or the BBC Radio iPlayer app for political thinking with Nick Robinson.